It's going to be wonderful, all right? God is good. Hey, you guys ready for the word of the Lord today? All right, amen. Get your Bibles in hand. You're welcome to stand. You're welcome to stay seated. You're welcome to kneel. In fact, today I'll let you roll in the aisles, all right? Let's pray together today. Father, we're so grateful. We thank you for your spirit, for your presence in this place today, God. We thank you that the battle belongs to the Lord. Now, you are fighting our battles, God. You are the warrior. You are our defense. You are our rock. You are our strong tower, God, that we can run into and we are safe. Today, Lord, as we open up your word, open it up to us. Open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, our hearts to have a good understanding. May we be the good ground where the word is sown. May it produce fruit in each and every one of our individual lives. Welcome, Holy Spirit. You are the teacher of the church. Today, Lord, we don't want to hear from the ideas and the philosophies of man, from the educated, uneducated, the social systems, the politics, God. We don't want to hear from culture or media, from any other thing, God. We want to hear from you. So welcome, Holy Spirit. Be our teacher. Be our guide. Give us your vision, your instruction, your wisdom, your direction, even the correction where we've gotten off track, Lord. And we'll give you the praise, the glory, and the honor for it. God, today, don't just bless us. Oh, no, Lord. We don't want to be stingy with our blessings. God, bless all of our brothers and sisters here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet that are preaching and hearing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Denominational, non-denominational, doesn't matter to us. If they're preaching your gospel truth, lifting up your name, Lord, we bless them. God, bless our persecuted brothers and sisters. Watch over them, encourage them, strengthen them, deliver them. Lord, may they endure to the end of the glory of God. It's in Jesus' mighty name. We're all in agreement. We say... Amen. Today, as you're having a seat, go with me to Colossians, the fourth chapter. We are heading into the end of Colossians, chapter number four, going through line upon line, precept upon precept. For those of you that are joining us for the first time today, uh, today's message will stand on its own, so don't worry if you're going, wait a second, you've been preaching the whole book of Colossians and I missed the whole thing and I'm coming in right at the end? That's right, you're going to get the word of the Lord today. But in a two-part series called A Wise Walk and a Seasoned Talk. Colossians chapter number four, as it continues on, it starts to talk to us about practical everyday life, gives us some instructions for how we're to live our life. And in Colossians chapter 4, verse number 5, it starts out and it says, walk in wisdom towards those who are outside, redeeming the time. There is a wisdom of God for how we are to live our lives with people, the Bible says, who are outside. Outside of what? Outside of the faith. Outside of Christianity, people who are unbelievers, in other words, people who are lost and dying, broken and hurting, people who are headed for hell. That there's a wisdom for all of us that we are to redeem the time because the days are evil. And we're to live our lives out a certain way, and God wants us to have that wisdom. Now, if you didn't get a hold of that first message, I want you guys to go online and listen to it because it will bless you. But today, I want to talk to you about the next verse, verse number six, where it says this Let your speech always be with grace seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. God doesn't want just a wise walk. He also wants a seasoned talk. Any of you guys raised children? Remember when your kids were real little, right? You had them in the high chair, and all they could do is kind of, you know, and you'd go, use your words. Come on. Use your words. I want you to tell me what you want. I know that you know this because you've shouted it at me before. Okay, you know, whatever it is, right? And I believe that God has us, and he's growing us up, and he's maturing us. And God wants us to use our words. God wants us to tell someone about Jesus. That may freak some of you guys out because when you picture telling someone about Jesus, you're going, past. I can't do what you do. I can't stand up in front of thousands of people and, and, and preach the gospel. But God is not asking you to do what I do. He's already asked me to do the, what I do. God's asking you to go to your areas of influence, to go to the people that are in your life, and to use your words. God wants you to be his mouthpiece. God wants you to be the full-time minister of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. But I thought that was just for the paid staff at the church. I thought that was for all you guys to do. Listen, if it was all up to us, if it was just about us preaching the gospel, this church would not be the size that it is. Because we can't reach all the people that you reach. We don't have the relational equity in order to draw on and draw people into the house of God like you do. You are with people that I will never be with. You have influence with people that I will never have influence with. And so God wants to use you to go out and tell a lost and dying world about the love of Jesus Christ. That was the plan of God from the ages, is, is to get the, the pastors, the teachers, the, the apostles and the prophets and the evangelists to do what? To equip the saints. Can I translate it in IE terms? That's all, y'all. To equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. How many full-time ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ do we have in this place? Say, woo! 
There you are. See, that's all of us. God wants you to be his mouthpiece. He wants you to speak to others. But pastor, I don't have the gift of gab. You don't have to have the gift of gab. You just have to know how to use words to talk to somebody, all right? You've been doing it all your life. And so God wants to use you. See, oftentimes when we think about evangelism or telling someone about Jesus, we think about how confrontational it can be, right? Acts chapter number two, the Holy Spirit is poured out on the church. They go out, they're speaking in tongues. The, the, the people are gathered around. Everybody hears the wonderful works of God in their own language. And some people scoff and they say, all these men are drunk, right? Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, stands up in front of thousands of people. And he says, these men are not drunk as you think. But this is what the prophet Joel prophesied when he said that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, on your main, men servants and on your maid servants, right? And he starts to preach and they're pierced to the heart when they hear that they crucified the king of glory and they say what must we do and Peter confronts them repent and be baptized every one of you and we say well wait a second I, I, I that's not me I can't just repent and be baptized I can't set up a soapbox in the middle of the office or in my neighborhood but you know that there's more ways to preach the gospel and to speak to people there are so many ways to evangelize and in fact we see them all throughout the New Testament what about being invitational. John chapter number four, Jesus has the encounter with the woman of the well. In fact, he reads her mail. He says, girl, you don't got just one husband. You had five husbands, and the one you're with right now, he ain't yours. And she said, I perceive you're a prophet, right? Oh, oh yeah, he's a prophet. He just read your mail, girl. You didn't tell him none of that, and he knew it all by the Spirit of God. And so the Bible says that she ran back, and all she says is, come and see. Come and see the man who told me everything that I ever did. They said, whoa, he told you everything you ever did. We better go see this guy, right? Just come and see, and maybe that's you. Come and see. Come and see this guy that changed my life. Come and see this, this church that's loving. Come and see what the Lord is doing. It's invitational. What about testimonial? John chapter number 9, the man that was healed by Jesus, they said, give glory to God. Tell us what happened. He says, I don't know what happened. I don't know who he is. I don't know where he is. The only one thing that I know is that I was blind, and now I see. And maybe you don't have the, 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 the confrontational aspect of evangelism where you tell the people to repent and be baptized, but you can't tell them what the Lord has done in your life. You can't tell them, I was dead, and now I'm alive. I was blind, but now I see. I was in darkness, but now I'm in light. I was at the bottom level. And now God has raised me up to the top level. God has made me who I am today. He delivered me from drugs. God raised me up from the dead. God healed my physical body. God restored my marriage. God saved my children from a certain death. Come on, you have a testimony that God has done something in your life. I was blind, but now I see. How about relational? Mark chapter number five, Jesus heals a guy from a legion of demons. And what does he do? He says, I want you to go home and tell what things the Lord has done for you. Go home and tell them the great things that the Lord has done for you. It's so simple. It's so easy. Your family members, you know those ones that you avoid at Christmas and Easter? Just go tell them, hey, God's been doing great things in my life. God bless me. God loves me. I was reading the word the other day and God spoke to me. All you got to do is start to open your mouth and start to talk about the great things that the Lord has done for you. What about intellectual? Anybody like learning? Anybody like a, a, a good, you know, book, right? Sometimes we think that we have to check our brains at the door when we become Christians. We have to be these crazy, out of control, uh, you know, uneducated. You know, the Bible says, oh, Peter and, and those guys were uneducated fishermen. I guess we can't be educated if we're going to do anything in the kingdom. No, God wants to use your brain, right? He gave you that cranium that's up there. And so God wants to use that for the glory of God. Did you know the apostle Paul was highly educated? Not just educated. He was highly educated. He had the best instructors, they named him Gamaliel, right? He came from the best, the, the best stock. He was a, a Hebrew of Hebrews. He knew his lineage was to Benjamin, right? The tribe. Even though they were scattered, he could still trace his lineage. And so he had the best schools. He was also a Roman citizen. This guy was instructed in, in the ways of God as well as the ways of the world. And so God used this educated Pharisee of Pharisees, the Bible said. This guy had books of the Bible memorized. This guy was a teacher. And yet when he got radically saved, he, he, he said, I, I count all that as loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. But he still used his brains. 
He was there in Athens. Athens at that time was like the, the cranial capital of the world. It was the place where all the educated people came together and, and they would pontificate and they would philosophize and, and they would just sit around and talk about the newest ideas of the day. And so here's the apostle, and he's walking around Athens, and he's just getting angry. He's just getting mad. The blood on the inside of him is boiling. Why? Because he looks around, and he sees all these idols everywhere. He's incensed, right? Until he saw that there was an idol missing. And he walked up to it, and he noticed that at this place where there was an idol missing, that it said in the inscription, to the unknown God. In other words, we're going to worship all these gods, and just in case we missed anybody out there, we're going to go ahead and sacrifice to them so that we don't offend any of the gods and not have good things in our life. And Paul, with his beautiful, brilliant mind, started to preach them. He says, today I declare to you the unknown God. But guess what else? It doesn't stop there in Acts 17. He says, as your own poets have said, for we are his offspring. What does that mean? What is that the equivalent of? That means he said basically to them, as your own poets have said. What would that look like in today's terminology? It'd be like, hey, remember in Star Wars where the bad guy said, Luke, I am your father? Do you know that we're all under sin and that the devil is our daddy? right? You can preach the gospel from Star Wars. You can preach the gospel from Harry Potter. You can preach the gospel from anything that the Lord brings to you at that moment if you will use your head and follow the lead of the Spirit. Did Pastor Dan just say Harry Potter in the pulpit? Yes, I did. Should I go and read it? No, you shouldn't, right? But here's the deal. If your kids are reading it in school or there's something going on, be wise enough to understand and to know, hey, I can use this to tell someone about Jesus. Is anybody listening today? I like this last one. What about serving? Just simply serving somebody. Serving it up, right? Here's Philip. He's on the road. An Ethiopian eunuch is traveling. In Acts chapter number 8, he comes alongside and he hears him reading out of the book of Isaiah. And he simply says, do you understand? Do you understand what you're reading? Maybe as things are happening in the world, events are taking place, somebody notices that there's something going on. And all you got to say is, do you understand? Let me shine some light. Let me tell you what the Lord is doing. Let me tell you what God is saying through this. Can I help you on your journey? I love to serve people. I love, uh, you know, just watching as God breaks down walls and breaks down barriers as we serve people with a pure heart. Remember when I went on a trip to Israel, and I remember we were there in Jerusalem, just outside of Jerusalem. There's a street called Ben Yehuda Street. It's a very famous street, very well known. It's kind of the, the commerce center, right? All the shops and restaurants and all that kind of stuff right there on Ben Yehuda Street. As we were walking up Ben Yehuda Street, we wanted to minister to Jewish people, but we recognized and realized that if we just confronted them, they were going to push us away. They've had enough of that over the centuries, if you will. And so what we decided to do is go and buy some trash bags. And we just purchased some trash bags, and we started walking down the street, and we started picking up the trash as we went down the street. Not getting involved in anybody, not pushing around anybody, hey, get out of the way, let me get this trash. No, just walking around and picking up trash. A Hasidic Jew, you know what a Hasidic Jew is? They're the guys with the big furry hats and the, the curls coming down the side and the big long coats. I'm going, it's like 98 degrees outside, and you're wearing all that? What is going on, man? you got to be sweating under that thing. And yet they stopped us, and they said, please, please tell us, what are you doing? We're picking up trash. They said, whoa, 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 wait a second. Why are you Americans picking up Jewish trash? I said, I'm sorry, I didn't realize it was Jewish trash. Do you want to go ahead and hand it? I'll go find some American trash if you want. But we responded and we said, we're just sharing the love of Yeshua in a practical way. Yeshua is Jesus in Hebrew, by the way, in case y'all didn't pick up on that. But it broke down walls, and it was simply serving. Do you understand what's going on right here in front of your eyes? No matter what style you use, God has a way for you to speak to people. God wants you to bring the Word of God. You need to have a seasoned talk. And a seasoned talk looks like something. We see it in Colossians, the fourth chapter, verse Number five and verse number six. Remember, it says, walk in wisdom towards those who are outside, redeeming the time. Verse six, let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. A season talk, number one is this. Season talk is with grace. A season talk is with grace. Now, what is grace? Sometimes people think that grace is just unmerited favor, okay? Now, I would agree, grace is unmerited favor. There's nothing you could do to earn it. 
nothing you could do to deserve it, right? It is unmerited. It's not based on something that you could purchase, something that you could earn. It's unmerited. And yes, it is favor, right? Noah found grace or favor in the eyes of God. God saved him from the flood. In the same way, we get saved from sin. We get saved from hell. We get saved from the destruction that's coming, right? So it is unmerited favor. Yes, that is grace, but grace goes much beyond your salvation. You know that grace goes into every area of your life with God. Here's the way that we define grace here at the Rock Church Memorial Lowry Center. Grace is God's sovereign, divine ability to get the job done on our behalf when we can't do it. I've got that up on the overheads. If that's the first time you've heard that, great. If you've heard that over the years, I want you to all, everybody, say this with me, okay? Because we've got to get a hold of what grace is so that our speech can be with grace. Grace is what? God's sovereign, divine ability to get the job done on our behalf when we can't do it. Let's say that again. Grace, God's sovereign, divine ability to get the job done on our behalf when we can't do it. It's God's power in us. To do what is truth demands of us. It's the ability of God, the power of God, that goes beyond what you could do in the natural. Think about it this way. Witnessing is much more than a script of words. If that was all it was, then I could hand somebody a sheet of paper, a printout, and they would just be getting saved as I handed them the printout, right? All they would have to do is read that script. I remember one time uh, somebody had the salvation prayer on the back of their shirt, and they jokingly said to me, someone gets saved every time they read it. And I thought that was cool. Now, if that's all it was, then I'd have billboards. I'd have sky riding, right? I'd, I'd put it on Instagram videos and stories and all that kind of stuff. Why? So that everybody could just read it and they'd get saved. But the, it's not just the words. See, even, even gospel tracts and Bibles and those sorts of things, these have power only because the Spirit of God is on them. But without the Spirit of God, it's just paper and ink and leather and fabric. That's all it is, Right? In the same way, witnessing is more than just scripted words. It's more than just memorizing the Romans road or the four spiritual laws. Witnessing should be something that God has done on the inside of you that now you are sharing with someone else. It's coming out of the abundance of your heart that your mouth speaks like Jesus said. You are salt. You are light. So you are wall to wall, Holy Spirit on the inside. And when you start to speak, if you speak in the power of God, now the grace of God hits your speech and causes it to come alive on the inside of someone else. The gospel then should come out of the overflow of what is on the inside of you. The fullness of God that's on the inside of you. If you will witness in the power of the Holy Spirit and leave the results to God. Because you can't save a soul. You cannot redeem humanity. Only Jesus can do that. But he chooses to use the message of the gospel, the preaching. That's why it's called the foolishness of preaching. It doesn't make sense up here. And yet God takes that message and he gets the grace of God on it. And it makes all the difference in the world. What you share should be an extension of your own life. And your testimony. First Thessalonians there in Colossians chapter number five. Just look down to the next chapter in your Bible. Next book, next chapter, right? First Thessalonians chapter number one and verse number five. Look at it with me. It says, for our gospel did not come to you in word only. Notice it wasn't just a script. It wasn't just reading out off a page. Our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power. Everybody say power. That's dunamis in the Bible. Dunamis is where we get our word dynamite from. It's an explosive, it's a moving power that goes much beyond what you could do in the natural. And so he says it came in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance or fullness. It came in fullness. Wow. Then it goes on and says, as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. They lived their lives out in front of the people so that the words would be backed up by the lives that they saw being lived right in front of them. Our speech should be with grace, with the ability and the power of God that backs it. Second thing is this, is that our speech, if we're going to have a seasoned talk, a seasoned talk, number two, is salty. A seasoned talk is salty. I've been delighted when I go to stores and driving down the road, I see these bumper stickers and t-shirts and things that just say salty. I kind of like that, you know? And in the world, what they're talking about really is they're talking about being a little sassy. You know what I mean? That, that there's a little flavor in there. You know salt adds flavor to things? Anybody love bland food? Did I hear a yep? 
Anybody love bland food? No, that's what I thought, okay. So what do you do when the food is bland? You salt it, right? They were saying, chile, pastor, chile, salsa in the first. And you need some salt in your salsa too, all right? But you add salt to bring flavor. If you've got a nasty steak, it's just kind of bland and kind of just, meh. Just salt that sucker, man. Oh, oh my goodness, the flavors will pop, right? It takes it from bland to bam, all just with a little bit of salt. They even salt sweets. Why? Because it even brings out the sweetness and the flavors that are in those foods. But you know what else salt does? Salt preserves things. You know, back in the day before they had refrigeration and all that kind of stuff, they would just take salt and rub it all over the meat so that it wouldn't putrefy on their journeys. They'd be able to eat that meat because it was salted. It was preserved. Another thing that salt does is it cleanses, right? If you have a wound and you rub salt in it, it's burning. Why? It's killing things. It's cleansing that area. People have salt water pools these days that are just as potent as the chlorinated pools, right? It kills disease and things that's there in the water. Salt is a purifier. So with that in mind, I want you to turn with me to 2 Kings in the Old Testament. 2 Kings, and we're going to be in chapter number 2. 2 Kings chapter number 2. Turn there with me. The Old Testament. It's on page number 258 in my Bible. Hopefully that helped you all. 2 Kings chapter 2, we're going to be, read verse number 19 through verse number 22. This is in the New Living Translation. I'm going to read it to you, but you're welcome to follow along whatever translation you have. 2 Kings chapter number 2, we're going to see a prophet by the name of Elisha. Elisha has just received the mantle from his predecessor, Elijah. Elijah has given him his mantle, and now he is the prophet of the land because Elijah has been taken up into heaven on the chariots of fire. Okay? He takes that mantle and he does his first miracle. He parts the waters of the Jordan and walks across on dry land. Now, something happens in 2 Kings chapter number 2, in verse number 19. It says, one day the leaders of the town of Jericho visited Elisha. We have a problem, my lord, they told him. The town is located in pleasant surroundings. Everybody say pleasant surroundings. As you can see, but the water is bad. Everybody say bad. And the land is unproductive. Everybody say unproductive. Elijah said, bring me a new bowl with salt in it. So they brought it to him. Then he went out to the spring that supplied the town with water and threw the salt into it. And he said, this is what the Lord says. I have purified this water. It will no longer cause death or infertility. Verse 22. And the water has remained pure ever since. Some of your translations will say the water was healed from that very day to this day now. So what is God speaking? Okay. Remember, we're talking about salt being a purifying agent. That it is a preservative, that it cleanses things, and that it adds flavor to life. Here, the people of Jericho had a problem. They were under a curse, right? When Joshua cursed and said, cursed is the man who builds its gates. When he, hangs its, when he, when he completes its gates, it'll be at the cost of his firstborn child. And when he hangs the gates, it'll be at the cost of his secondborn. And that actually happened. You can read that in the Bible. And so this is a place that the people of God had come in and ultimately destroyed. It was under a curse. And they had a problem because now the people of God are living there again. The nation of Israel has moved in and they are living in Jericho. And they're living in a place that has a problem. The problem was that the water was bad, even though the surroundings were very pleasant. So Elijah asks for a new bowl, says to put salt in. And he goes to the spring, the source of the water, and he tosses the salt in. And it heals the water. They're no longer bitter. They're no longer bad. It no longer causes infertility in the plants and those sorts of things. But now it's healed and it's sweet and it's profitable. See, in our lives, we need to understand that we are in pleasant surroundings. And I'm not just talking about this valley, the San Bernardino, Riverside counties. No, I'm not talking about that, even though it is beautiful, even though we have great mountain ranges and it's wonderful. I believe that this place is a, a beautiful place. But beyond that... That humanity, when you look at humanity, isn't humanity beautiful? Isn't humanity wonderful? I mean, when you look at us, we are made in the image of God. The Bible says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Did you know that God knit humanity together in their mother's womb? And when you look at the cultures, when you look at uh, the different communities, when you look at humanity, uh, your heart just goes out. It's pleasant surroundings. There's such potential in mankind. Oftentimes when I look at people and I see the things that they're doing, I say, man, that's so wonderful. That's so awesome. But my heart breaks because even though 
We're in pleasant surroundings. The water is bad. What does that mean? Anytime you see streams like that, waters, many times it's referring to streams of thought, ways of life, pathways and roadways of doing things, things that are going in. There is a source that's bubbling up from the inside of humanity that's causing streams to come out of us, and it's bad. But wait a second. It looks like water. It's clear. We can actually drink it. It's okay, right? But look at the fruit. Look at the production of what's coming out of that water. The seeds are not producing fruit. The land is unproductive. See, the Bible says that you will know them by their fruit, right? Even though humanity is beautiful, even though we're in pleasant surroundings, the water is bad, and therefore the things that are being produced out of people's lives are unproductive. Humanity on its own without God in their streams of thinking and their ways of life, it may seem right, it may seem good, but in the end, it does not lead to eternal life. It's unfruitful, it's unproductive, and it leads down the wrong path. And so we have to do something. What do we have to do? What the prophet of God said, get me a new bowl. Did you know that you are a vessel? Do you know that when you were born again, that you have become a new creation? You are a container, and inside of you, you carry around in you the life and death of Jesus Christ. That is the salt. Jesus told his disciples, have salt in yourself. You are the salt of the earth, right? You are the preserving agent. You are the flavor of life. You are the one who, when you toss that salt from that new bowl into the stream, but guys, don't just get off in the streams of education and the streams of entertainment and the streams of thought processes and the streams of social systems and media and all that kind of stuff. No, go to the source. Get to the heart of the issue. Humanity is dead. They're lost. They're dying and they're going to go to hell without Jesus. Toss the salt into the source. And I don't believe for a second that it was the salt chemical content that changed the waters and made them healed. No, that was a miracle that took place. God was using something natural to declare something spiritual to you and I today. And he contained it for thousands of years for us to realize that our natural means are not going to make it. you got to take this new bowl with the saltiness on the inside of it. And when you speak, speak to the source. Speak to the issue. We're all dead in sin. We're going to die and go to hell unless we repent and follow Jesus. Toss the salt in and then God will do the miraculous. God will heal the waters, and as he heals the water, now all of a sudden, humanity, our lives, not only will we be in pleasant surroundings, but producing the fruit that God wants to see in our lives. Don't sidestep issues. We're lost. Humanity, in its mind frame, in its ways, in its heart of hearts, is dead and unproductive. Throw the salt and give them Jesus, and he will cleanse them at their source. Last one for us today is this. Not only should our speech be seasoned with grace, Not only should our speech be seasoned with salt, but finally, a seasoned talk is savvy. A seasoned talk is savvy. Now, for some of you guys who maybe are wondering, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by savvy? The New Oxford American Dictionary defines savvy as shrewdness and practical knowledge. The ability to make good judgments. Let me read that to you again. It's the shrewdness and practical knowledge. The ability to make judgments good judgments. God wants us to know how we ought to answer each one. Individually, we need to know how to answer people when they come and talk to us and when we encounter them and when we see those doors of opportunity for us to speak to them. And every person's different. There's not a one-size-fits-all solution other than Jesus himself, right? But there are different ways to get the gospel into people's hearts. And we need to understand and we need to know and be savvy enough to introduce the gospel in the seasons that God brings them before us. Calvin Coolidge was vice president of the United States during the years of 1921 to 1923 under President Warren Harding. He was not a very active vice president, but he took great pleasure in presiding over the Senate. One day as he was presiding, one senator angrily told another to go straight to hell. The offended senator openly complained to Coolidge, but Coolidge leafed through the book of rules as the man made his complaint. Finally, he looked up and he replied, I've read the rule book. You don't have to go. Here's the deal, you guys. 
We need to be savvy. We need to know that when people come to us, when people start bringing these things up, we need to be savvy enough to say, hey, guys, I've read the book. You don't have to die and go to hell. That you can have life in Jesus Christ. That you can know God in his ways. You can live a fulfilled life here on the earth. We need to be savvy. We need to understand the way to approach people. I remember one time uh, I was in a small group with a couple of guys, and, and uh, you know, as we were there in this small group with these guys, one of the guys was, was not a Christian. One of the guys was a Christian. And the guy that was not a Christian was doing what non-Christians do, right? He was just being a fool, just acting up, doing all this crazy stuff. Wasn't asking us about Jesus or anything like that. But the other guy who I knew was a Christian, he looked at me and said, you need Jesus, you jerk. I was like, you just lost him. That you, you might as well just go home. Go lay down. You know, like, take a break, mister. This is not working. It's not going to happen. But the Bible tells us in 1 Peter, in the New Testament, 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 15. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Now, if you don't understand meekness and fear, let me read it to you in the Amplified Bible. It says to do this courteously and respectfully. Throwing Jesus in someone's face and calling them a jerk, that's not going to work. Now, bold truth does work, right? There are times where God's going to say, hey, tell them. You need to tell them the truth. Truth is potent, just like salt, right? Sometimes it stings when it's applied to our life. Sometimes tell, it's not always fun. Uh, guys, I have had to say the worst things to people, that the outcome of your life, if you continue on it, is going to drag you to hell. I've had to tell people, listen, you're listening to doctrines of demons, and if you stay on that path, the devil's going to keep you in chains all your life, and you're going to go to hell at the end of it. Truth can be confrontational and potent, but at the same time, I did it in a spirit of meekness. Submission to God's will and fear. In other words, there's a trembling that, guys, I'm not just browbeating somebody else with this message. I realize that I myself, if I don't watch my ways myself, I could end up shipwrecked. And therefore, we watch, and it says to do this courteously and respectfully. When you bring the word of God to somebody, especially when they ask you, hey, why are you a Christian? Why do you, here's a question you've probably been asked, why do you waste your time? Why do you waste your life? Wait, you give money to the church? Why do you waste your money? They don't understand. And rather than come back, well, you need Jesus, you jerk. You're going to lose the sale, all right? With courtesy and with respect. Well, let me tell you about the hope that's in me. Let me tell you what God's done in my life. Let me relate with you all the good things that God has done for me. Why, why don't you come and see, right? Well, why don't I tell you I was in darkness, but now I'm in light. I was blind, but now I see. Let's have the spiritual savvy to know when the doors are open to us to walk through them with grace, to walk through them with saltiness, and to walk through them with savvy, knowing the audience that we're speaking to. Come on, if you got something for the word of the Lord, give God a great big praise today. <laughs> Hallelujah. Can we just take a moment right now and let's pray together. Will you bow your heads, close your eyes. No one get up, no one leave during this time. Church is not done. We've got a couple more things we want to do with you guys before we leave. But let me...